Yeah, no, we, it says 16th, so we have uh, we have tomorrow yet. Oh, the 16th, I got you, yeah. Tomorrow. I was wishful thinking here, I guess. You look like an almost expired carton of milk, Craig. <laughs> That's where I got it from, uh, Andy. It was a carton of milk. I got the uh, used by. Okay. That. Okay. Good morning. Um, Council, please come to order. All right. We are ready to begin with agenda item B1. But what it does we'll is have it Dr. opportunity um, for for the future. Yeah. So this is probably a good time to, to remind those who are not uh, presenting or, or speaking to mute their phones. Okay, so with that, um, we'll go to Dr. Kate Hoppala to give us the presentation on agenda item D1. Good morning, Dr. Hoppala. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, for the record, this is Kate Hoppala with council staff. Today, under the D1 agenda item, the council will receive a presentation on a discussion paper that explores options for new access opportunities for smaller vessels within the Bering Sea Aleutian Island, Pacific Cod, less than 60 foot hook and line and pot CV sector. The council requested this paper in October 2019, and it is a conceptual starting point for these issues. The paper provides the opportunity to the council to discuss and give direction on its preference for potential future work related to small vessel access opportunities in the BSAI Pacific Cod under 60 sector and posted to the e agenda item or to the e agenda for this item is the discussion paper, the presentation and the action memo. And I will be giving the presentation today, but I'll note that Ms. Kristen Milani from Nymph Sustainable Fisheries is also available for questions. Um, I'll pause to see if there's anything from the council uh, in terms of questions or comments before moving forward with the presentation. Thanks, Dr. Hopla. I don't see any. Whenever you're ready. Thanks. So this discussion paper is a response to public comments describing the access challenges that smaller hook and line or pot CVs face. And specifically that public comment identified an increase in participation within the under 60 sector and intersector competition from a subgroup of larger hook and line or pot vessels that are greater than or equal to 58 feet in length with increased capacity and efficiencies. 
The council's October 2019 motion directed staff to evaluate the potential impact of expanding the allowable participants to fish off the jig sector allocation to small fixed gear catcher vessels for example, vessels that were less than 57 feet in length overall, trip limits up to 15,000 pounds, pot limits less than 25 pots as options to potentially address the access challenges facing smaller vessels. And largely following the structure of the paper, the presentation today will provide background on the BSAI Pacific Cod under 60 and jig sectors and then discuss different options for defining a small vessel sector allocation for BSAI Pacific Cod, and then options for defining eligibility for the new small vessel sector and potential next steps for the council. The BSAI Pacific Cod less than 60 foot uh, hook and line or pot CV sector includes all catcher vessels that are using hook and line or pot gear and are under 60 feet in length overall. A federal LLP license is required for vessels participating in directed fishing for LLP groundfish species, and vessels in the under-60 sector need a non-trial LLP to participate in the federal fisheries, but they are exempt from the Pacific Cod endorsement on their LLP. Since Amendment 85 was implemented in 2008, this sector has received a 2% allocation of BSAI Pacific Cod, which is made fully available on January 1st, and it is not broken out with seasonal apportionment. And I'll note that Table 2 in the document shows the nine BSAI Pacific Cod sectors allocations and their corresponding seasons. The under 60 sector relies on reallocations from other BSAI Pacific Cod sectors in order to have a reopening later in the year. And typically they receive a reallocation from the jig sector in early January, which extends their opportunity to fish earlier in the year. Regulations require another reallocation from the jig sector to the under 60 sector on or around September 1st, if unused tax is projected in the jig sector. Table four shows the under 60 sectors initial allocation final allocation and then the reallocations from other BSAI Pacific Cod sectors from 2008 to 2020. On average, the under 60 sector has harvested 215% of its initial allocation since 2008. And then on average, reallocations from the jig sector have contributed to approximately 30% of the under 60 sector's final allocation since Amendment 85 was implemented. The paper separates the under 60 sector into two vessel size subgroups, those that are less than or equal to 57 feet in length overall and vessels that are greater than 57 feet in length overall to better understand participation and the potential impacts. Vessels that are equal to 57 feet in length are included within the small vessel subgroup because vessel modifications and increased efficiencies were described at 58 feet length in length overall. Uh, and that has been described as stakeholders as contributing to intersector competition. And so table three depicts the total count of vessels that have made at least one targeted landing of BSAI Pacific Cod in the under 60 sector and the count of vessels by the size subgroups since 2004. And the majority of vessels that are historically participating in the under 60 sector are greater than 57 feet in length. Figure one depicts the amount of targeted BSAI Pacific Cod harvested by each vessel size subgroup since 2008. The greater than 57 feet in length overall subgroup consistently harvests the majority of the under 60 sectors final allocation. And on average, larger vessels that are 58 or 59 feet in length overall have harvested approximately 84% of the under 60 sectors final allocation of BSAI Pacific Cod. The paper considered revenue dependence data, which shows that both vessel length subgroups have a relatively similar level of dependence on the federal BSAI Pacific Cod fishery from 2011 to 2019 in terms of their gross ex vessel revenues. On average, the federal uh, fishery for BSAI Pacific Cod accounts for 21% of the less than or equal to 57 foot subgroup and 26% for the greater than 57 foot subgroup. And then at the vessel level, 
There are 14 vessels that are 58 or 59 feet in length that depend on the federal BSAI Pacific Cod Fishery for more than 50% of their gross ex-vessel revenue and six vessels that are less than or equal to 57 feet in length overall that depend on uh, the BSAI federal cod fishery for more than 50% of their gross ex vessel revenue. Moving to the jig sector, this sector includes all vessels using jig gear. Uh, vessels fishing in this sector do not need an LLP license in the BSAI if they're less than 60 feet in length overall and use no more than five jig machines, one line per machine, and 15 hooks per line. The number of jig vessels that have been participating in the directed BSAI Pacific Cod Fishery has varied over the last 18 years, ranging from a low of one vessel in 2017 and 2018 to a high of 19 vessels in 2004. In 2020, three vessels participated in this federal jig fishery, and one jig vessel has shown consistent participation in the target fishery over the last five years and would likely be the most impacted by this action. The jig sector has an initial allocation of 1.4% under Amendment 85, and the sector's allocation is apportioned on a trimester basis. Unused jig tack is typically reallocated to the under 60 sector on a seasonal basis. And since 2008, the jig sector has on average harvested 6% of its initial allocation. And then due to the jig sector's relatively low utilization of its initial allocation, a significant portion is reallocated to the under 60 sector early in the year as required by Amendment 85 regulations. The paper considers four options for a BSAI Pacific Cod small vessel sector allocation, and these options are depicted at a high level here. And I'm gonna walk through the last three with more detail because the first is no action. So under this scenario, the under 60 sector and jig sector allocations, as well as the reallocation structure would remain unchanged. Um, but I will note that if the council chooses to move this action forward, an amendment to the BSAI groundfish FMP is necessary to change the allocations for each sector, reclassify the existing sectors, or create a new sector because the BSAI Pacific Cod allocations were assigned as an amendment to the BSAI groundfish FMP. The second option that's explored in the paper uh, is to reclassify the current BSAI Pacific Cod jig sector by combining smaller fixed gear and jig vessels and then allow this new small vessel sector to fish the 1.4% jig allocation. Under this option, there would continue to be nine BSAI Pacific Cod sectors, but the structure of the current under 60 and jig sectors would change. Table seven shows the combined federal non-CDQ BSAI Pacific Cod target landings from the less than or equal to 57 foot in length overall hook and line and pot vessels, as well as jig vessels since 2008. And so had this new small vessel sector existed since 2008, it would have fully utilized the current jig sector's allocation of 1.4% in only one year, which is 2019. And on average, this hypothetical new sector composed of smaller fixed gear vessels and jig vessels would have utilized 54% of the jig sector's initial allocation of BSAI Pacific Cod. And so there's some uncertainty about whether a new small vessel sector could fully utilize this jig allocation of 1.4%. Some additional considerations for this option are that if the council chose to reclassify the jig sector, it would be important to consider whether the new small vessel sector would have an annual allocation like the current under 60 sector or seasonal apportionments like the current jig sector. So if the council chose to allocate PSAI Pacific Cod TAC on an annual basis for this reclassified sector, it's possible that this change may require a section seven consultation for stellar sea lions since, since it would be changing the way TAC is issued seasonally. And then jig vessels are generally operating in the B season or the summer months. And so under either scenario of using an annual allocation or a seasonal allocation, it is possible that jig vessels in this reclassified sector could be constrained from fishing in the B season without some form of protection. And there's uncertainty about what the impact might be uh, just because the under 60 sector has closed by the time jig sector's B season begins and it does not reopen until September 1st after the B season has closed.
Option three explored in the paper is to create a new BSAI Pacific Cod catcher vessel sector that would be composed of small fixed gear vessels by separating them from the current under 60 sector. This would effectively create a 10th BSAI Pacific Cod sector and would require the council to determine an allocation for the new sector. One option that's put forward in the paper is to allow the smaller hook and line or pot vessels in this new sector to competitively fish the under 60 sector allocation. And when the under 60 sector closes, allow those vessels to fish the jig sector's allocation. If the council's considering uh, creating a 10th BSAI Pacific Cod sector, it's also possible that the council could choose to reevaluate the current BSAI Pacific Cod allocations for either the under 60 sector, the jig sector, or both. Option four for a small vessel sector allocation that's explored in the paper is that the council could choose to develop a lap program for the under 60 sector to slow the pace of fishing and potentially reduce that competition, uh, intersector competition within the under 60 sector. The council has the discretion to develop a lap program that allows vessel owners in the current under 60 sector to receive individual quota and form cooperatives. And the council could also establish fishing community entities or regional fishing association entities under the lap for a BSAI Pacific Cod sector. Fishing community entities are eligible to receive limited access privileges during the initial allocation process. And the council could develop criteria for fishing communities to receive initial allocations. Fishing community entities are not voluntary associations and would be the holder of an allocated privilege until transferred. And in contrast, regional fishing associations or voluntary associations formed according to criteria developed by the council and would consist of participants who hold quota for the region covered by the regional fishing association. Regional fishing associations cannot receive initial allocations of limited access privileges but may acquire them by way of transfer from a limited access privilege holder after the initial allocation process. And so if the council wanted to move this option forward, it would need to consider and specify its goals and objectives for a LAP program, as well as potential subsequent fishing community entities or regional fishing associations, if that's the direction that the council chose to pursue. If the council chooses to move this action forward, a second important piece is deciding how to define a small vessel or eligibility for a potential new sector. The paper considers several options and they're listed here uh, and they're based on the council's October 2019 motion and I'll walk through each option with a bit more detail. The council can Dr. use Apple? a vessel. Yep. I, I apologize. I just wanted to, to break in here since uh, you're making good time and remind members of the, uh, the public that uh, we have, the SSC did not take this up and the AP has already given their report. So um, this will, uh, at the end of the, the presentation uh, that you're giving will be the cutoff time to sign up for public testimony. So just encourage anybody who wants to testify to testify, uh, sign up soon. With that, uh, back to you, Dr. Hopla. Thank you. So the council could choose to use a vessel size limit to define eligibility for a small fixed gear sector. Table nine in the paper shows the number of vessels by length for each year since 2008. And although it is not, although it is not based on a unique count, so to help the council determine a maximum length overall, if that's its preference, using 55 feet as the maximum length overall would affect seven vessels that have made at least one targeted landing in the federal BSAI Pacific Cod fishery since 2008. And if the council chose to use 56 feet as the maximum length overall, there are two vessels that are 57 feet in length that have made at least one targeted BSAI Pacific Cod landing since 2008 that would be impacted. However, it is important to note that using a length-based system for categorizing vessel eligibility in a small boat sector could present economic incentives to vessel owners to alter the vessel size. So these breakout counts could change because, for example, larger vessels may decrease their length, whereas smaller vessels could increase their length overall to compete in a sector that they feel would be more advantageous. The council could also consider using a fishing trip limit to define eligibility for the smaller BSAI Pacific Cod vessel sector. 
Currently, there is no fishing trip limit for the under 60 year jig sector, and Table 10 shows the count of BSAI Pacific Cod trips based on a range of landings to better understand the impacts of a potential fishing trip limit. From 2009 to 2019, only 11% of the fishing trips that were taken by the under 60 sector were less than 15,000 pounds. And then looking at just the smaller vessels, which are less than or equal to 57 feet in length overall, approximately 39% of the trips taken during this time period were less than 15,000 pounds. So because the majority of the fishing trips are greater than the potential 15,000 pound limit, a fishing trip limit of that size may be overly restrictive and reduce efficiencies even for those smaller fixed gear vessels. However, as noted in the paper, there's several caveats to this data because the size of a fishing trip may not reflect a vessel's ability to compete in the sector. And a fishing trip could be influenced by many considerations like tender or processor availability, weather, crew health, and other considerations. And then it's also possible that introducing a fishing trip limit could affect on water safety, encouraging some vessels to fish at a faster pace to complete more than one fishing trip in a day. Uh, and there would also be enforcement challenges with respect to auditing landings and remote ports on tenders, which could take significant OLE resources for both outreach and enforcement. The council could consider using a gear limit and the council's original motion specified 25 pots for analysis. Uh, however, the under 60 sector includes hook and line vessels as well. So the council would need to consider a gear limit for hook and line vessels. And this could be established uh, by specifying a maximum number of lines and hooks per line that could be used during the fishery. Uh, it's possible that there is some observer data available to inform the specific number of pots that a vessel is using in a set but observers do not collect data on the total gear inventory that a vessel is using, which could impose some enforcement challenges. And effectively tracking individual pots that could be set and retrieved multiple times in a day would be difficult and likely require onerous reporting requirements to effectively track. The council could choose to develop a sub area endorsement for ground fish LLP. And this type of endorsement could require a vessel with an LLP to fish within a certain range. So for example, 15 nautical miles of a particular community or set of communities. And in this way, the LLP sub area endorsement could provide the council with an opportunity to provide more protection for vessels operating in specific areas without pursuing a LAP program. And in terms of data, vessels that hold an FFP must comply with Groundfish Observer and Electronic Monitoring Program regulations and with NIMS record keeping and reporting requirements. Vessels that hold an FFP must carry vessel monitoring systems if they participate in directed fishing for Pacific Cod in federal waters. And so VMS information could provide data to assess whether smaller fixed gear vessels have historically been fishing uh, in years where they carried VMS and determine the potential participation and impact of using a sub area endorsement. In moving this option forward, the council would need to consider qualifi qualification or eligibility criteria, whether only those small fixed gear vessels that are eligible for the sub area endorsement would have access to the potential small vessel sector allocation and the impacts that would have on other non-qualifying vessels and that adding endorsements to the LLP could raise the cost uh, for future entrants, although it's uncertain what that actual cost would be or the extent to which LLP changes would affect willingness to participate in the BSAI Pacific Cod Federal Fishery. And then I'll just note the paper did consider whether or not it would be possible to designate a federal ground fish fishery as super exclusive and super exclusive status uh, drawn from the state definition means that a vessel registered in a super exclusive fishery could not participate in any other fishery of the same species. And the state of Alaska constitution gives the authority to the state or Alaska Board of Fisheries to de designate state water fisheries as super exclusive. But this is not a term or concept that exists in federal law that could be readily applied and transferred to fisheries in federal waters. And designating a federal BSAI Pacific Cod allocation for smaller hook and line or pot catcher vessels uh, as super exclusive would not be a viable option for new access opportunities. However, the council could achieve a similar effect by crafting narrow eligibility criteria or restricting access to a small number of hook and line or pot catcher vessels for valid conservation and management reasons, uh, but it would still need 
it would still be necessary to consider the BSAI Pacific Cod allocation that these vessels could prosecute. And then circling back, just a reminder, the purpose of this discussion paper was to provide the council with information on new access opportunities for smaller hook and line or pot vessels that are operating in the BSAI Pacific Cod fishery. And moving forward, the council could take several related actions, including no action. The council could choose to request additional information through an expanded discussion paper or move the action forward into an analysis. And the primary overarching criteria to consider are the specific objectives of the action, the BSAI Pacific Cod allocation that a new potential small vessel sector would be able to fish, and then the criteria for defining eligibility. And that concludes the staff presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Habla. Ms. Baker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hoppola. I do have a question back on your slide about the options for a sub-area endorsement for LLP licenses. I was just wondering, uh, you went through um, the information that potentially could uh, be used to consider that sub-area endorsement option. And I, I just wondered if, if you could confirm for me, I'm not recalling that the, the North Pacific Council has any other type of endorsement uh, programs like this in our current LLP license program uh, based on a sub area like this. And, and can you confirm that for me or remind me if we do and in which program? Thank you through the chair. Uh, it is my understanding that the council does not have another sub area, LLP sub area endorsement that works in this way. Um, but I'll ask Ms. Milani, she might have um, additional information that she could add on. Um, sure, um, my name is Kristen Milani. I work for National Marine Fisheries Service and I'm part of the in-season management team. Um, Ms. Baker, through the chair, um, she had that. She has that correct. There's, there's not any other uh, sub-area endorsements that that work like this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks to you both. That that answers my question. No more questions. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hoplet. I was hoping you could maybe um, just, I'm having trouble um, understanding what the motivation of um, a fisherman would be that has a 58 foot, a super eight to modify their boat to participate in a fishery that was limited by length by say 55 feet. So they have to take three feet off their boat and what would they gain in that? They're already participating in the fishery that has a much larger catch. So what would be the motivation to do that? You had mentioned earlier that it was possible that other vessels would enter that um, smaller fishery. And I just wonder what the motivation would be. Thank you, through the chair. I think the motivation would depend on uh, what option the council would pursue in terms of an allocation. So in option three, for example, if the council were to choose to allow smaller fixed gear vessels to fish the current under 60 sector allocation, and then when that season closes, allow only small vessels to fish the jig sector allocation, it's possible that that scenario would present an opportunity or a motivation for vessels to modify their length overall, if that would qualify them to go and fish the jig sector allocation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hapala. I just had two, two questions. One was on uh, the statement about the jig sector and, and the jig vessel, I guess, most impacted uh, by this potential action. And I, 
And I wondered if you could qualify that when I look at your data, there's one vessel that's been consistently participating, but still, of course, as you stated, reallocating about 94% of that allocation to other sectors. And so is your conclusion that the jig sector would be impacted by any of these actions or particularly option two, or that if there is an impact, it's on one vessel? I'm trying to get to the bottom of whether the jig sector would be affected at all. Thank you through the chair. Uh, Ms. Kimball, I think it depends on, so since jig vessels are typically participating in the B season, it would depend on what the council would pursue. So for example, under option two, if the jig sector and the under 60 sector are reclassified, but there's no protection for the jig vessel or future entrants and participating in the B season, because those smaller fixed year vessels are not currently participating in the B season, we're not sure what that would look like. And so there is a chance that without some sort of protection that the smaller fixed gear vessels could um, could preempt that participation from a, a jig vessel, even though the utilization of the initial and final, the initial allocation is relatively low. Thank you, Dr. Haplan. My second question is, is really just on the a suite of options uh, provided in the paper and the council motion for this was, was fairly narrow. Um, and I, I'm looking at, you know, option three, option four for sub area endorsement or a full catch share program for the less than 60 foot sector. And I just hoped you could provide some input on where those options came from. Thank you through the chair, Ms. Kimball, for the question. Uh, staff, when we were preparing the paper had run through several different ideas and we just wanted to put the full scope of potential conceptual options on the table for the council and the sub area endorsement as well as the full lap program was born from public comment that the council received in December 2020 related to the lap program from the Charles CV lap program excuse me from stakeholders uh, who were interested in seeing whether or not uh, it was possible to do a fishing committee entity under that lap program for smaller fixed gear vessels. And so we were just trying to pursue the full range of potential options um, in helping the council make this early decision. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do have one additional question, Dr. Hoppola. Back on your slide 17, I was trying to, there it is. Okay, I was trying to reconcile this presentation with the one I downloaded on the agenda and I couldn't find the slide, so thank you very much. Um, I was, uh, I, I noticed this slide when you went through the presentation and I want, I noticed particularly that one vessel that is 55 feet LOA is included in your unique count of hook and line caught vessels with target landings since 2008. But when I look at the table in the discussion paper, it, it seems to show up to seven vessels recently with landings and maybe up to 11 since 2008. So can you walk through that with me, how you are getting the numbers that are in those bullets there uh, with respect to maybe a specific table in the discussion paper that I'm missing? Yes, thank you through the chair, Ms. Baker, for the question. Um, so this bullet is specific to one vessel that is 55 feet in length overall, and there was one vessel in Table 9 in the year 2010. And then um, less than 55 feet in length overall, uh, there's different count, a different count uh, year to year. And so what I had done in the presentation is try to convey the data in a different story in a more succinct way, looking at uh, 57 feet, 56 feet, and 55 feet as the exact length overall uh, and try to convey what the impact would be depending upon the maximum length overall that the council might consider choosing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hoppola, for that clarification. I appreciate it. Any further 
further questions. Ms. Kimball, did you have another question? No, sorry. Okay, I don't see any additional questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoppala. Okay, that will, um, that will bring us to public testimony on D1. Like we've got six members of the public signed up to testify. First up is Tom Robinson, following Mr. Robinson is Rick Fest, and then Dustin Dickerson. I think that uh, Mr. Robinson may not be available to testify this morning, so um, we can always circle back at the end of um, testimony and see see if he is available. But if Mr. Robinson is is not available, we can move on to Rick Fest. And just for uh, those who are new to our public comment process, um, again, individuals and companies have three minutes. Uh, associations have six minutes. We have a timer um, on the on the Adobe Connect screen here, um, and I will also be timing in case there's a, um, a, a technical issue with our timer, and I will let you know if your time is up. Um, so with that, Rick Seth, are you available? And we can circle back to him. Uh, Dustin Dickerson. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Um, yep, can hear you. Uh, you sounded a little garbled. Well, your connection's okay. okay. Can I call in on the landline because our health service is here? Oh boy, that's going to be challenging, uh, Mr. Dickerson, to, to understand your comments. Do you have a, a better option for calling in? Yes, I do. I'm, I'm going to try it right now. Um, okay, I think Mr. Dickerson's going to try a, a different connection. Um, so in the meantime, let's see if Adam Lalich is available. Yes, uh, this is Adam Lulich. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, Mr. Lulich. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Council. Yeah, my name's Adam Lulich, 40 year, 43 year fisherman in Alaska, 14 years jigging in Western Gulf, Bering Sea, and Aleutian Islands. I was initially opposed to pot and hook and line fishing off the jig quota, even though jiggers will never catch their jig quota and rollover is quite straightforward. <clears throat> After reviewing option two and what UMFA has proposed, pots and hook and line fishing off the A and C season and B for jig vessels only, at this time I feel it leaves plenty of room for jig vessels. This will leave options for jig vessels in Dutch Harbor Accutan to fish the A and C, but having the B season just for jiggers just and if a processing plant ever opens out west, as the Aleutian Island jig fishery at this time of year is federal and can be very good. As far as size limit and sub areas, size limit has no effect on the jig fleet. But sub areas, if the council proceeds with the small boat, uh, pot and hook and line fishery, that we as jig vessels are able to fish the areas we all have traditionally, and there's no sub areas for jig vessels. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lodge. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, 
think, Mr. Dickerson, did you get reconnected? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm ready to go if you can hear me okay now. Yes, much better. Thank you. Mr. Dickerson. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. For the record, my name is Dustin Dickerson. Um, I'll be joined today with, uh, I believe Rachel dunker -Sloot is on the phone with me, um, or on the line. Uh, sure. I am the Vice President of the Unalaska Native Fishermen's Association. We would like to thank the entire body of the AP for their continued support of the small boat issues in our area and to thank council staff for the discussion paper, recognizing Kate Happel as the lead in this endeavor. During this process, I have spoken many times with Krista Milani at our Dutch Harbor NIMS office and the good people at our local ADF and G office as we studied the various aspects of the discussion paper in hopes of getting the clearest picture of how to move forward with the choices that we had. Our conclusion was that in section four, option two was best, but we would like to leave the jig trimester seasonal allocations in place. If small boats using fixed gear are allowed to fish off the jig sector allocation, they should only do so during the first and the third portions of the trimester, leaving the second portion for jig boats only. Our next conclusion was to support option four of section five that would create sub area endorsements for boats with substantial history in the four stat areas within 15 miles of Dutch Harbor but due to privacy concerns, it was impossible to determine a span of qualifying years that would benefit the small boats without leaving the door open to unintended consequences. So for that reason, we are supporting option one of section five, a vessel size limit equal to or less than 55 feet. We apologize for the confusion as today's testimony does not correspond with our comment letter or testimony at the AP. All said, a size limit is a better path forward. It will provide stability for the small boats fishing today and create access for those of tomorrow. The boats that choose to come here in jig will not have their opportunities diminished and it will also breathe life into a suffering pool of small boat longliners. Also and importantly, it will keep alive a previous council's wish to allow the smaller vessels of a sector fish to catch even after the larger vessels of the sector have taken their allocation. Thank you. And that's my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Are there any questions? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dickerson, for your testimony. And I'm wondering uh, if, if you can uh, remind us, from your perspective, uh, what the problem is with the status quo in terms of the smaller vessels that you're uh, trying to protect and provide stability for. What is, is it uh, related to the current situation uh, with the cod fishery that makes it really difficult for those boats to participate? Well, the problem is, is that smaller boats typically fish within 15 miles of Dutch Harbor. I stated in my a AP testimony that the big boats go to Unimac Pass and the smaller boats fish within 15 miles of Dutch Harbor. And I relied completely on cod fishing both seasons for four years beginning um, 2015. And there were very few cod around. We don't have the ability to travel. Um, sometimes we have northerly uh, weather um, for extended periods of time, I mean throughout the season, sometimes it's southerly, sometimes there are fish out front, sometimes they're not. We don't have the ability to travel and so um, we're stuck 
within this 15 mile radius of, of Dutch Harbor with changing weather patterns that are not al always conducive to small boat fishing and also just the fish patterns that, as I said, sometimes there's fish here and sometimes there's not. The fact is, is that there's really not a lot of fish around here. Um, and, and that's why we don't have any large boat participation within 15 miles of town, so to speak. And that's why you have, you know, the, the, the larger vessels of the sector fish Unimac Pass, and that's for a very good reason. Um, <clears throat> so an extended season um, would would go a long way towards preserving small boat access that is not always available to natural occurrences. You know, I'll say that after that four-year stint of fishing cod only, we started the year $50,000 in debt. And that's what really got me started three years ago on this, on this quest. But, you know, there was a, there was a, not only a, a it, we just had fewer days to fish because of the number of boats that now participate. And so for that reason, um, that has been my argument this, this entire time is that, is that we, we just need more days on the water than boats, the larger vessels of the sector that can travel to where the fish are. They can stack 50 pots on the back of their deck and they can run around from, you know, uh, I don't know. They have a quite a large range they can fish, and if there's not fish in one spot, they can they have the ability to go to another. Well, that those options simply are not available to small local boats that that fish um, out front of town here. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Dickerson, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your clarification. Of my question, the answer to my question. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Mr. Mezzaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, um, Mr. Dickerson, for your uh, persistence on this issue. I think uh, it's a good lesson to other stakeholders that are in small boat fisheries are underrepresented, that if you come here and say the same thing enough times and it makes sense, eventually you get some interest from the council. So I'm glad to see that you did that. Uh, my question is really about unintended consequences. And I was trying to get at that with Dr. Hapala, but I think it might be a better question to pose to you being that you're in the fishery and you see what's going on. What are the chances that if we um, go down the road of looking at a vessel size restriction that um, some super eights end up taking two or three feet off the front of their boat and coming in there just to catch that share of the jig quota, which is just going to essentially put you in the same position that you're in right now. Do you think that's something that's likely or do you think the fishing just isn't consistent enough or um, good enough to warrant vessel modification just to get access to a small amount of fish? Well, I think that that people, fishermen often violate the spirit of, uh, of, of, of what the law is. For instance, that's what a loophole is. That's the definition of a loophole is people that are exploiting the spirit of, of what it was that the council was trying to, to uh, create. Um, you know, we already have super eights that are actually Super 56s. There, there's a couple of boats that have that are 56 foot long. That have a two foot removable bow, and the reason for that was because they were able to get an LLP with a Gulf endorsement. Uh, but it was, but the, but the endorsement was only for a boat that was 56, and so in order to have access to the Gulf and to the Bering Sea, the decision was made in the yard to just make the boat a 56 foot with a two foot removable bow. I think it's entirely possible that, um, that uh, in fact, I, I have to say that my boat is actually 55 and a half. I, and on my documentation, it says 56. 
Um, we chose 55 foot, and I, I'm I'm going to, and if the council decides to go with the size limit, I'm going to end up cutting six inches off my own bow to qualify as a 50 foot as a 55 foot, just so 56 foot boats are not allowed to fish off the jig allocation. I think that the spirit of this is to allow small boat fishing and I and I just don't think that these larger boats should um, should participate um, in a in a small boat fishery in, in one that's designated for a small boat I don't you know I have many many friends in the uh, in the 50 that fish these super eights many friends and and I and I do not hold anything against the people that are more ambitious than I am and and want to go out and really kill a bunch of fish um, and and many of these people actually support this endeavor um, I think that it's it it is possible that that somebody could actually create a 55 foot or a super 55 I don't I, I don't know why uh, why that would not be possible. Um, so for that reason, if the council does decide to, uh, to, to create or to allow the smaller vessels to fish off the jig allocation, I would hope that, that the council could revisit this issue in three years' time so that if there are unintended consequences, for instance, if there are people that are violating the spirit of what it is that the, tri the council's trying to do, that um, that there would be a, a provision to revisit this and 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 do something about it. So um, so I think that those are the. I, I think I have I clarified what I believe unintended consequences could be. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. Dickerson? Okay. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Next up is Frank Kelty. Good morning, Mr. Canada. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Kelty. Good morning. I, uh, it sounds like you hear me five by five. Um, I'm here, uh, for the record, my name is Frank Kelty, uh, speaking on behalf of the city of Unalaska on this uh, uh, D1, uh, Pacific Cod Small Boat Access. Um, it seems like we get to talk about this every year for the, I don't know if this is the third year or, or, or what, but uh, it's many years, and uh, the city of Unalaska uh, uh, wants to thank the AP for uh, asking for further analysis on this. They voted 17 to 0 uh, to the, asking the council to continue to look at this. Uh, we also support the comments made earlier today by Mr. Dickerson of UMFA. Uh, Unalaska has been a supporter of uh, UMFA's request on this, like I stated, for, for many years. Uh, we feel that uh, option 2 is the best fit on this action. Um, Oh, I think the analysis should go, as Mr. Dickerson suggested, go down to 55 feet. I know in the analysis it's 57. Uh, I think the, uh, they could take that down and look at it at 55 uh, feet. Um, uh, we support the uh, trimester staying in place. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, the jig allocation is 60, 20, 20, uh, leaving the B 20% for the jig allocation. As of June 5th, there's been no jig landings. Uh, in Unalaska, uh, and there was a minimal amount, I believe it was only 10 metric tons delivered last year. Uh, so I, I would think that uh, if the jig sector had the uh, bee season to themselves, uh, there would probably be enough quota for what we've seen for um, fishing the past few years. Um, moving on, uh, I think the, the tribe master allocation also uh, would probably uh, uh, help with sea lion regulations. Um, and I guess in closing, uh, uh, Unalaska, the city of Unalaska has had 
uh, concerns for many years on uh, wanting to keep this local small boat fleet viable. And I think uh, by taking action uh, and doing further analysis on this, uh, it'll help uh, alleviate the, the problem we have with the overcapitalization uh, and uh, in the fishery. And, uh, you know, we've had reduced quotas on cod for the last few years, and the, the local boat, boat fleet has to deal with uh, uh, the severe w winter weather. And the last two years have been real bad uh, in uh, January through April. So uh, I think this action is, uh, needs to move forward and uh, continue to look at it. And I want to thank you for your time and for the Council's uh, uh, taking this uh, consideration of our comments. Thank you very much. Kelsey, are there any questions? Mr. Mesro, did you have a question? Angry hand, sorry. Okay. Um, Mr. Mesro was just waving at you, Mr. Kelsey. Um, any I'm waving back. <laughs> All right. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Next up is Hannah Heidbuck. Hey there. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Hannah Heimbuck. Thanks again for the opportunity to comment. Uh, testifying for the under 60 cod harvesters. Um, you know, this is not actually a discussion that my organization has taken a position on at this time. We have both small and large vessels in our group, as well as vessels home ported inside and outside of Dutch Harbor. So, you know, any action taken that diverges opportunity within the under 60 sector is likely to impact uh, my members differently from each other. So we've been really focused on issues that could benefit or harm the entire under 60 sector. Um, you know, that being said, some of the specifics from the discussion thus far, I just I just wanted to offer some considerations in the case that you, you take some next steps here. Uh, as you heard from Adam, there, there might be some potential under option two, a, a limited opportunity for small boats to participate in the jig uh, quota in the ANC season with um, some very clear parameters for how that would intersect with the full under 60 sector. But I uh, really think there's a lot of undefined factors here that would really help um, us to take a position on it. Um, while there might be an option in the paper that would achieve that original intent of providing for, for small boat opportunity, I, I don't think that a one-time history-based endorsement as described in the AP motion is it. Uh, you know, and protecting small boat access is why, um, as an aside, I think it's really important to hold the jig sector harmless in this. The jig fishery is actually a great small boat opportunity, uh, and it's my understanding that market challenges is the limiting factor in, in motivating more participants right now. But, um, but again, specifically addressing the AP motion, I think these types of programs generally in order to be meaningful to the community and to future generations of fishermen really need to think beyond the subset of specific boats that would qualify today. It should provide an, an ongoing pathway for smaller operations to enter a meaningful opportunity without extraordinary cost. And I don't think a, think a limited time sub area endorsement based on a history snapshot really achieves that given that it's, it's likely to immediately create a barrier to entry for future participants, which was noted in the paper. Um, so, you know, maybe five, ten years later, you have a younger local fisherman that wants to start building their fishing business um, in order to fish the opportunity that supposedly for smaller local operations, they now have to make an additional capital investment. Um, so then one of my other questions there is, is whether the sub-area endorsement is just a means for identifying that subset of vessels or if you're actually restricting future access to that sub-area. If that's the case, I think we have a safety issue for any current or future smaller vessels that don't qualify for the area, as that might be the near shore space um, more likely to be fished by a smaller vessel. Um, and if using a history-based endorsement to allow access to the jig quota, then I think we should analyze and, and apply only to the portion of the jig quota that that vessel or subset of vessels have actually harvested. I think if we're not allowing new entrants into a sub-area endorsement, it seems odd not to, to structure the initial investigation to capture dependents. And then I, I also think under any option, we need to be particularly cognizant of the interactions between federal and state water opportunity, just since the opening and closure dates are really interdependent. And if you're diverging opportunity within the under 60 sector, that could really impact the pattern of effort in, in both fisheries. But my, my main concern here was around the AP motion and the creation of new barriers to entry. You know, within the ISQ access pool conversation, many industry representatives have been working to figure out how to establish opportunities for new entrants and community-based participants 
that address some of the barriers to entry created as the ISQ program evolved. And a history-based approach here kind of feels like reverse engineering those same barriers in an open access small boat fishery as a means to lock in access for a subset, uh, really kind of carving off an opportunity for a small number of specific boats rather than providing for ongoing community access. But, you know, I know that's just one possible route forward. Overall, I think there's just a few too many undefined parameters here for us to tell you, you know, exactly what a suitable route forward is or to lay out more detailed concerns uh, because the options here are very diverse. As you heard in public testimony, the ask around this has changed quite a bit over time and quite a bit over the course of this meeting. Uh, as you saw in the last slide of the presentation, there are considerable factors to identify if this were to move forward, including defining specific objectives, criteria for identifying potential participants, and then, of course, allocative decisions. And that's important so that we can be exceedingly clear how any change would benefit or harm local vessels, the greater under 60 sector, particularly new entrants, how many and, and to what degree. And so I think it would be really helpful to get a clear and consistent recommendation from stakeholders for addressing those factors, as has been um, the case and requested in initial development of other access programs. And um, honestly, I don't feel like I can, I can offer more substantial comments in this conversation about next steps without some of those clarifying factors, and then particularly without knowing what the long-term realities for fall fishing will be for the under-60 sector. And I think that will be determined um, by the final outcomes of the trawl CD program and then how we deal with some of these PCOT overages and seen. Um, but I, I, I would say it's very important to us to consider the cumulative impacts of, of all of these potential changes to the sector. I think the spirit of the AP discussion and of this topic when it was introduced to the council was around the need to provide for sustained participation for smaller, smaller local fishing businesses that operate differently from more competitive vessels. It's a worthwhile conversation, but still very much in the development and conceptual stage. I think any steps forward should focus on offering specific criteria for that vision and should be forward thinking in its capacity to create opportunity for current and future generations of community-based fishermen with smaller operations. It should be cognizant of impacts to the full under 60 sector and particularly of impacts to the jig sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Heimbach. Any questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ms. Heimbach, thank you very much for your testimony. You, you touched on a lot of the um, things I was sort of thinking about as I was listening both to the staff presentation and a previous public testimony. Um, and and you actually, I, I thought you had a, a sentence towards the end that um, summed this up very well for me. Um, this isn't at all about um, entry level. Um, in fact, uh, although maybe those circles sort of overlap broadly, but uh, and I wish I could remember your exact word, but you talked about a local-based um, small small boat um, fishery that um, is um, being eroded by um, um, increasing competition in, in other parts of the same sector. And, uh, and, and we've heard in testimony that, that, the, that, that it's a choice um, that some commercial fishers want to make, and I'm, I'm sure this is something you deal with in your group in particular on a pretty regular basis, that some choose to um, choose different business models that uh, may depend more or less on increasing levels of capital and an interest in becoming increasingly competitive. Others choose a different business model that has choose those. How much, my question for you out of all that, because I think you kind of walked up to the edge of it. Um, the, my question for you is how much of that is actually the council's business, just from your perspective? Um, and and how much of that is is really um, just market forces or, or other things? Uh, it, it's not a really fair question, but it's clear you've been thinking about this a lot. And so I'm really interested in your opinion on, on um, and, and I recognize maybe you can't even answer it based on your organization, but just if you're, if you're willing to take a stab at it, I would find it useful. <laughs> sure, through the chair, thanks for the question, Mr. Twight. Uh, you're right, that's a difficult question. It's kind of a philosophical concept. Um, yeah, how, how long and how much should a council or any management body 
um, manage and then further manage and further manage a fishery based on the um, impacts of that fishery as it evolves over time. Um, I think the the participants in the under 60 sector have evolved to participate effectively in the fishery that uh, was designed and offered to that sector, right? And um, and many of them have become quite competitive in that. And I and I understand that that's not everybody's business model. Um, you know, I've I've spoken to the council speaking now just as myself here uh, quite a bit about providing for. Um, for new insurance and young fishermen, and and I, you know, very much support concepts of community access. Uh, that being said, to answer your question, I I don't know how how far you go. You know, wh where does it end? Because no matter what fishing opportunity you create, there will be um, factors of market and competition that evolve within that sector that then perhaps um, you know want additional attention later. And and how and how much time do you really spend managing and further managing um, those opportunities? I think we could do that in absolutely any fishery that comes before the council that has those interesting factors of competition. Um, so that's probably just uh, offering more philosophy to your question rather than an answer. But I, I think that's an important one to consider. Thanks. I appreciate your willingness to tackle that. Dr. Baltiger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Ms. Heimbach. That, that was good testimony. Uh, w one question, uh, you suggest it needs more time to work this out, the various uh, ideas and parameters, uh, but I am re recalling something that we've heard in testimony and we all know this has been ongoing for several years already. So uh, why do you think more time would be the solution to this when the council's been looking at this since uh, 2010 or something in that order. Uh, through the chair, thanks for the question, Dr. Balsinger. Yeah, I mean, I hesitate to suggest more time. I understand that there's been a, a request to address, um, you know, concerns about competition within the sector. It's, it's not something my members have necessarily, you know, wanted to take a strong position on, like I said, because we have, um, both large and small vessels, but I think I am referring directly to the changes in the ask and the intent that I have heard, um, and just as a stakeholder trying to form um, just some considerations around this, I I feel like um, because that ask and the, the testimony and support has changed, um, even over the course of this meeting, I guess I, I just want a clear, a clear position with some clear criteria um, and potential impacts to evaluate um, is what I'm looking for as a stakeholder to comment. Um, and so the, the time is not necessarily a reflection that we haven't been talking about this for a few years, but just that the, the intent and the ask seems to evolve um, every meeting. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Dr. Bosker. Further questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Heimbach. All right, uh, so that brings us to our list. I'll circle back around. I understand Mr. Fest uh, is, is going to pass on testimony. Tom Robinson, Tom Robinson, are you available to testify? We are concluded with public testimony at this point then. Let's go ahead and take a, a little stand down and allow a little bit of time to, to prepare for action here. Come back at uh, 9.15 Alaska time and see what action council wants to take. 9.15 Alaska time.
Thank you. Please connect order. Okay, we've heard the staff presentation, uh, gotten the AC report, and heard public comment on agenda item D1. Council wish to take any action. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a motion that was sent to staff. I just need to get my thoughts together here. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the motion is that the council adopts the following purpose and need and set of alternatives for initial review. Purpose and need, increased participation in the less than 60 feet hook and line and pot catcher vessel Pacific Cod sector by higher capacity vessels over 57 feet LOA has negatively impacted smaller vessels in the sector through shortened seasons. These shortened seasons limit smaller vessels' ability to compete within the sector as they are limited to fish in less productive waters near ports due to their size. The jig sector allocation has not historically been fully utilized, particularly in the A and C seasons. Allowing these smaller catcher vessels using hook and line and pot gear to harvest specific cods from the jig sector allocation may provide additional opportunities for current fishery participants and potential new entrants with smaller catcher vessels without negatively impacting catcher vessels using jig gear. Alternative, alternative one, status quo. Alternative two, Redefine the current BSAI specific cod jig sector to include hook and line and pot CD less than or equal to option one, 55 feet LOA, option two, 56 feet LOA, and a sub option that would apply to both options one and two, B season fishery would remain jig gear only fishery. And with a second, I'll speak to my motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Clear second. Second by Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Down. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I uh, really just wanted to start with uh, thanking uh, the, the written comment, the people who submitted written comments for this particular agenda item and, and the testimony that we had today. Uh, as we've discussed already, this has been uh, an issue that's been discussed both within and outside the council for quite some time now. Uh, the motion that I have put forward, uh, I believe, is, is both consistent with uh, the options that were considered in the discussion paper that we had uh, and also with the testimony that we heard today. The motion would maintain nine uh, BSAI Pacific Cod sectors, uh, but the jig sector would be expanded. Uh, to include uh, what we're calling the smaller hook and line and pot CDs. Uh, and uh, just as a little bit of a reminder, uh, the A and C seasons have historically been underutilized by the jig fleet, uh, while the B season is more fully utilized uh, due to more favorable weather and, and other types of conditions. Uh, under this motion, uh, if the smaller hook and line and pot CDs were limited uh, to fishing the jig allocation during the A and C season. Uh, I think we envision that the jig fleet could operate as they currently do now uh, during the B season, and that's the rationale for uh, the sub-option to consider uh, looking at that. Uh, the, as we've heard about today in testimony, uh, some of the different capacity capabilities uh, within uh, the less than 60 hook and line and pot sector uh, have largely driven increased competition and some higher capacity vessels uh, to create the problems uh, that were outlined for us today in terms of some of these uh, smaller vessels that uh, have traditionally been uh, homeported and based in Alaska. 
Uh, in the written public testimony, um, one fisherman using jig gear did express concern uh, about the development of the new sector uh, and, and really just uh, lended support for maintaining a jig sector quota. However, uh, we also heard testimony today, which I very much appreciated uh, in, in terms of this approach uh, to potentially look at um, limiting uh, redefining the current jig sector to only include the A and C seasons and leaving uh, the B season a jig gear fishery only. So uh, given the very limited participation in the A and C season jig sector, uh, I do believe uh, the motion, this motion and, and the options that we're looking at will maintain the opportunity, uh, could maintain the opportunity for existing jig participants, which I've noted uh, that that uh, not negatively impacting catcher vessels using jig gear would be uh, uh, an objective of this action. Uh, the representatives of UNFA have expressed the desire to preserve economic opportunity for uh, small vessels and to keep these vessels operating during a longer season uh, because that's important for those vessels uh, to fish the less productive waters near port. Uh, moving these smaller vessels to the jig sector would likely be the most effective way to accomplish this goal. I really appreciated the discussion we've had today uh, about the different approaches for defining uh, these smaller vessels and, and completely understand and recognize that vessel size and some of the other options that we've been looking at uh, may very well not be perfect solutions to address all of the issues. Uh, but those are the traditional tools available to the council, and uh, that is what I'm proposing we go forward and evaluate in, in this motion, Mr. Chair. And with that, um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. Mr. Mesro. Thank you, um, Ms. Baker, for the motion, and uh, I appreciate its simplicity. Um, and I was reflecting back on the questions that I asked uh, the staff and the testifier. And what it dawned on me is that a Super 8 is not really made by its length overall. It's really made by its capacity. And that's really its beam or its width. And I'm wondering if um, if contained within the motion that you've made, it would be reasonable to assume that the staff might explore the things that make uh, under 60 boats a larger boat besides the length. So maybe some description of the width of a vessel so that if we decided to refine options or sub options in the future, we could look at a length and width requirement to avoid um, people just taking off a removable bow to participate in this. It's a lot harder to change the length of your boat and it's definitely not worth doing. And so I'm wondering, even though your motion is specific about length, would it would you imagine that the staff would also consider that as something that we could draw from in a future analysis? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the question. Uh, I would say that I think as, as part of the analysis going forward, should this motion pass, I, I would anticipate that the staff would address those types of issues in terms of length and width and capacity uh, potentially in, in the analysis going forward to characterize the fleet that we're talking about. Uh, and so I think that it would be my expectation in, in terms of those types of descriptions being in the initial review analysis. Uh, in terms of the council actually considering capacity metrics other than length, uh, for purposes of this action, I am uh, quite hesitant at this point in time uh, to contemplate that based on this council's fairly extensive experience trying to do that in the past. By my memory, that is a really challenging uh, metric to try and uh, capture and control in these somewhat uh, blunt regulatory tools that we have. 
Uh, but with that said, uh, like I said, I, I would expect uh, capacity type descriptions and um, information to be included uh, in the analysis going forward. And, and at that time, I suppose, yes, the council could consider whether there were further refinements to uh, the vessel size uh, option in terms of defining the small vessels that I'm looking at in this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Um, any further questions on the motion? All right, let's go to amendment. No amendments. Um, any comments on the motion? Mr. Twight. Mr. Twight, uh, it looks like you're muted. Mr. Twight? Uh, Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Baker, for the motion. I, I will be supporting it. I, uh, looking forward to the initial review. This is an interesting one, just be, just because I, I understand the, the interest in folks in, in uh, resolving some of the conflicts with the, with the larger vessels. But at the same time, I, I think it's always, to me, it's been a, a piece of, of the fishery that, that has allowed uh, some entry level opportunity because there's a, a little, um, you know, excess in, in, in this sector, you know, as well as, you know, the option to keep the jig sector protected. So, so again, I'm not kind of sure where I'll, I'll land on this, but I, I think it uh, will be an interesting review and look, look forward to, to uh, the initial review. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I should be unmuted now. Okay. Um, I, I do support the motion and um, appreciate Ms. Baker's um, choice of a fairly simple uh, approach. I, I would hope that the um, analysis will um, take a look at some of the issues around durability. Uh, and by that, I mean, how long would we not a forecast, but just would this be essentially a permanent sort of fix um, or is this a more likely a temporary fix? And I'm thinking along the lines of a couple of Mr. Mesero's questions about um, that we also refer to as unanticipated consequences. Um, if, if we're going to end up just in a cycle of in order to address the needs of this particular group, if we're going to end up in a cycle of sort of never-ending needing to fix every few years, come up with a new way of, of protecting them. I think that's an important thing for us to understand uh, as we contemplate this. And so I, I would hope that the analysis can, can address some of those issues around whether this is likely to be a durable fix or whether this is likely to be a fix that um, within a few years will um, have problems of its own. Thank you. Mr. Clay. Mr. Jensen. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the motion, Ms. Baker. Yeah, I'll be voting in support of this. This has been on the table for quite some time, both on the on the council side and the state side. We've had different uh, options up before us, and we haven't done much on the state side. We ran into problems with vessel length issues. Maybe the uh, federal will be able to solve it better than the, the state was. Um, so I'll be supporting it uh, to protect the long-term small boat fishermen as well as uh, provide opportunity for new entrants with, with, that have smaller boats. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm going to be supporting this motion, but in looking through the analysis, um, it's clear that this sector has been impacted by shorter COD seasons and lower COD tax, as have all stakeholders who rely on Pacific COD. And so in the next version of the analysis, I'm hoping that there can be some um, discussion about, you know, whether the impacts to this sector are greater than or simply um, the same as all other COD-dependent fishermen um, and, and just take a look at that. And I really, I guess I would like to align myself uh, with the comments we heard in public testimony particularly from Ms. Heimbuck about some of the complexities of this that and some things that need to be fleshed out. So I'm going to support this going forward for analysis, but I do think that uh, some of the data in this discussion paper, particularly figure one from, from page eight, raises a question in my mind about whether, whether this sector is being impacted over and above um, all of the other cod dependent sectors that rely on this resource. And so I'm hoping we can hear more about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Baker, for moving this forward. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Dr. Balsinger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the motion. I, I will support it. Uh, I expect it will be durable. Uh, as long as the cod resource is durable. And so, you know, we've made several major changes to cod management in the Bering Sea, and uh, we don't worry about how durable those fixes have been. I can't remember how many amendments we made to the halibut sablefish IFQ program, uh, and we weren't worried about the durability of those fixes. We still have things we want to change on it. And of course, this issue has been brought to us well before the cod crash. So it's, uh, it's not something that is inspired by the COD crash, and although they may not be more affected by it than, than other sectors who rely on COD, surely it was a problem, at least in the, in the minds of people bringing it to us well before the COD had the crash. So uh, I appreciate the motion. I will support it. Thanks. Mr. Plum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baker, for the motion. I'm going to support this. Um, I will align myself with some of the comments from Mr. Twight that I'm concerned that we could end up uh, chasing a problem. I'm not sure we've hit on the ultimate solution here, and I have concerns about how durable this might be. But for uh, the uh, uh, purpose and need statement, I do appreciate the, the length rather than the area approach that Ms. Baker has taken here. So I'm going to support this and, and we'll see where it goes and I'll look forward to further testimony on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dem. Any further comments? All right. I think we are ready to vote then. Uh, is there any opposition to the motion? No opposition. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Anything further on agenda item D1? Okay. All right. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is uh, D4. And uh, recall, Council, that we already heard uh, from Ms. Sarah Cleaver and uh, Dr. Sherry Dressel, we heard that what essentially was the, the staff presentation on this already. I did want to um, uh, offer Ms. Cleaver a chance to give us any uh, further direction or have the council ask any further questions before we move into uh, public testimony. And uh, my, my thought is after um, a potential exchange with Ms. Cleaver. We'll go ahead and take a, a morning break, allow a chance for uh, public to sign up to testify, and then come back and um, take any testimony and then action. Um, so, uh, Ms. Cleaver or uh, uh, council members? Good 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman. This is Sarah Cleaver. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so as Mr. Chairman has noted, you've been provided uh, by Dr. Dressel with the summary of the workshop, which is attached to the Council E agenda, as well as the um, updated version of that report. And that reflects the SSC's mo most current recommendations regarding these risk tables. So um, again, it's anticipated that any guidance that comes out of um, that, cut, that came out of the SSC meeting and any additional council guidance will be brought to the plan teams at their September meeting, um, in which time they will the plan teams will have an opportunity to provide any additional input of their own, and then the guidance for using risk tables in the uh, 2021 assessments will be finalized in October. Um, so the, the action here in front of the council is mainly to provide any additional input, either regarding the SSC's recommendations or, um, or the council's own input. And then we will take all of that to the planning team meeting. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cleaver. Any questions from council members? I don't see any. Thank you, Ms. Cleaver. So let's go ahead and um, take a, a morning break um, and uh, we'll come back and see if anybody would like to testify. Come back at 9.50 Alaska time and again, potentially uh, hear any testimony and then see what action council would like to take. Back at 9.50 Alaska time. Nobody signed up yet. Are you going away?
<clears throat> Council Blake, come to order. Refreshing my browser here. I do not see that we have anybody signed up to uh, testify on agenda item D4. So I will look to the council to see what action we'd like to take. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have a motion I sent to staff just a second ago. Not up on my screen yet. I'm just waiting. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion reads, the council supports the preliminary SSC guidance on the application of the risk tables and looks forward to final recommendations from the SSC and council in October 2021. The council supports SSC recommendations to provide risk tables during each full assessment. The council also supports delay of application of the risk table to the crab specifications process until further progress is made on ground fish. In addition, the council requests the SSC consider the following when developing its final recommendations in October. Include description of any new or modified concern categories, including whether positive stock trends should be included as similar concerns. Request the SSC consider the roles of the stock authors and or plan teams in presenting risk and the role of the SSC in making specific recommendations on potential reductions from max ABC if appropriate. Clear language relative to SSC guidance that the risk tables are intended to inform the SSC determination of adjusting ABC from maximum permissible when needed. Previous reductions to max ABC should not be the basis for reducing max ABC unless relevant risk factors for a stock continue to be present. The council recommends that the consideration of risk and its incorporation into the assessment process continue to be re regularly reviewed by the council and SSC. And with a second, I'll speak to it. Second, Craig. Second by Mr. Cross. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, just very briefly, I, I really do appreciate the thorough review of the SSC and the SSC report on this item. Um, this is critically important to our process and our basic tenant of sustainability. I think it, it increases in importance as we try to address uncertainty that's not capped in the stock assessments or captured in the tier system related to climate or other factors. So I, I very much appreciate the SSC's time and effort um, and the clear report. Um, this motion is intended to support the initial recommendations of the SSC and acknowledge the stage of the process that we're in, um, anticipating a discussion with the plan team this fall, as Ms. Cleaver noted, and looking to final SSC and council recommendations in October. Um, I have supported here in the first paragraph that initial and I think pretty consistent recommendation that risk tables are provided during each full assessment. Um, I've also acknowledged uh, from concerns expressed by council members and others that we want to firm up guidance for groundfish first uh, before trying to apply to the crab specifications. I believe the report already acknowledged a different approach may be needed for crab. Um, our current ABC buffer approach already includes a lot of flexibility to increase or decrease from ABC based on any model or stock concerns. And we typically set, crab ABCs are typically set below max ABC as specified in the FMP. So I'm not saying um, that the risk table might not be helpful in the future with both transparency and consistency in the crab specifications process, but I think we need to be a little further in our own guidance before trying to apply it there. And I wanted to be explicit about that. Um, the motion also provides some questions or considerations for the SSC when they get into this agenda item in October. Um, these are really based on some of the questions posed during the SSC report on this item. I likely didn't capture all of them from council members, so I hope council members feel free to add or amend if they feel necessary um, in order to be really explicit about SSC discussion. And finally, I think the motion is pretty explicit that the intent is this is an evolving process, that we support it as a council, and we want our SSC and the council to stay engaged as it develops. So that's my motion, Mr. Chair, and I be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Are there any questions? Dr. Baltiger. Dr. Baltiger, we're not reading you. 
Uh, thank you. I was double muted and wasn't smart enough to know it. So, so thanks, Ms. Kimball, for the motion. I support it. I, I think it's an important way for the council to evolve. I was discussing this particular idea with my boss back in D.C., and he, he was wondering, who do we think owns the risk table? Is it the stock assessment author? Is it the plan team? Is it the SSC? Or is it the council? And of course, I listened to the I listened to the SSC uh, when they discussed this in the meeting, and I listened to um, as Dr. Dressel, uh report to the council on it. And so, I, I, without explicitly answering that, I think it belongs to the combination of the stock assessment office, the plan team, and the SSC. But I wonder what your thought is on that. Not that it has to be on the motion, but just how you think of it. That's a great question, Dr. Ball, the chair. Um, I do believe it's a it's a combination of the entities, but I, I think it's, I personally think it's the council's intent and responsibility to take some ownership of the risk table and how it's used in the assessment process. I think that is our responsibility. Um, but I do think it's pretty clear when you get down to it technically that, that it's the stock assessment author and the plan team that that work together to, to fill out that risk table. They're closest to the stocks in which they are assessing. They can provide a clear um, you know, level of concern or risk that we should be aware of that aren't currently captured anywhere in their assessment. I think they're the only ones that are well positioned to fill out that table. And then I think it's the SSC's job to, to look at that risk table and the risk presented and determine whether a reduction from max ABC should result as a, as a result of those presentation of risks. And ultimately, of course, the SSC's determination of OFLs and ABCs, and the council has to approve those, but does not have really a say in setting ABC. That's the SSC's job. So I, I hope I've laid it out um, for you. That's how I see it, and I'd be glad to have more discussions on this now or, or as it evolves, because I think it's a really important question. Thank you for that. That, that satisfies my, my curiosity right now. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Dr. Walter. Any further questions on the motion? Any amendments or comments on the motion? Mr. Cross. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I support this motion and, and kind of in regards to, to I think that that is the stock assessment author and I and I kind of asked this to, to uh, Dr. Dressel, you know, how the, who starts it and how does it go? Um, I think that um, it really, really attended the plan to the plan team meeting well over here table. the table. I think it's really important and it's captured in the last part of uh, Ms. Kimball's motion. I think that will um, continue to um, view how the risk table is used. Um, it helps when we are sent to understand the amount of, 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 what the level of protection and put into this. Um, and so I just want to take your hand on this. Um, not that we make the risk table, not that we do any of that, but that we understand and uh, how the risk table be put together, and that if we have input on to that, um, how we think the way they're doing it, um, it's obviously there. Council needs to uh, stay involved in in uh, how to get something. Further comments on the motion. Push.
can't think on that day and they very true. We have the MS scheme for, for credit. The state sets tax um, tax setting is based on a male only. There are um, a number of durations and uncertainties that you when the state sets back, and, and a lot of those things are key. Um, I, I agree that probably not easy to We have our system already a different approach um, is needed for a crab, and, and I hope the SSC will um, ha have some of those decisions. Ms. Bush, comment? Okay. Go ahead and vote. Is there any opposition to them? No opposition. The motion passed now, please. Anything further on the agenda item four? Can go ahead and move to agenda two. on D2 and uh, tell us what we're doing with that today. Uh, here to present the discussion paper uh, on D2, just waiting for the presentation to come up. I am very pleased uh, with me today to have Mary Perini, Steve Whitney, and also Dan Gaithel, who is the Assessment Officer for Sablefish. Um, they are available to answer questions um, if I'm not able to, and I am fully anticipating drawing on their expertise. So in December 2020, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council passed a motion requesting the staff prepare a discussion paper to examine management tools that the council may consider to limit or prevent overages of trawl sablefish area and sector-specific allocations. The Council specified that the discussion paper should provide relevant data and consider management measures to address sector allocation overages that may include time and area closures, reduced allocations to target species with high sablefish bycatch, intercooperative agreements and incentive programs, lower MRAs or extended MRA status, in effect no trawl sablefish directed fishing, and actions taken by other councils to manage sector allocations. The Council also requested that the discussion paper include a discussion of management implications of restraining catch to regional area and sector allocations, any benefits to the sablefish stock of reducing juvenile sablefish fishing mortality, and projected impacts to the trawl and fixed gear sectors. Okay. Uttered. Mr. McLean? Mr. McLean, yes. I, I apologize. I'd like to ask members of the public to please mute your phones. Um, and only unmute uh, when we get to public testimony. All right, um, back to you, Mr. McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was hearing the same thing. So um, the request from the council was initiated in response to the public comment and a letter submitted to the Assistant Administrator for NOAA Fisheries in October 2020 that identified a number of complaints about the trawl sector exceeding its stable fish allocation, concerns about exceeding established annual catch limits, uh, a perceived lack of accountability measures to prevent those exceedances, and how sablefish is apportioned between management areas in the setting of a statewide overfishing level. In addition to the management measures requested by the Council, uh, this paper also provides context for understanding sablefish ACLs and how they're managed and sablefish catch in the trawl fisheries. This paper draws heavily from the 2020 sablefish assessment by Dan Gaithel et al and several other council analyses and discussion papers, and those should be considered. They're incorporated by reference. A single sablefish stock occupies the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, and the Gulf of Alaska. 
In December 2019, the FCC concluded that the best scientific information supports an Alaska-wide OFL. However, acceptable biological catches or ABCs for sablefish continue to be specified by management areas. The abundance of sablefish in Alaska has cycled between a number of peaks and valleys since at least the 1960s. Levels of low abundance in the 1970s followed periods of heavy fishing intensity and were followed by peaks in the mid-1980s that were associated with exceptionally large year classes in the late 1970s. Abundance was relatively stable from the late 1980s through about 2000, but declined consistently until about 2015 when all abundance indices showed considerable rebounds, particularly in the longline survey where the 2020 catch represented the highest relative population numbers in the time series. The recovery has largely been dominated by several yard, large year classes. We can see those here from 2014, 2016, and 2017. And those large year classes have led to age composition in the longline survey that is skewed towards younger fish. And here we're looking at select years from the figure in uh, the 2020 stock assessments. You can see the younger year classes in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Now, despite similar trends in, to survey biomass, spawning stock biomass has lagged recent increases in survey biomass because the recent increases have largely consisted of those young and mature fish. The spawning stock biomass reached a time series low in 2018, but was higher in 2019, as shown in figure three on page three of the document. Terminal spawning biomass in 2020 is estimated to be 30% of the MFISH spawning biomass and is expected to increase rapidly to about 42% of the unfished spawning biomass in 2021 as these large year classes mature. Current model projections indicate, projections indicate that the statewide stock is not subject to overfishing, not overfished, and not approaching an overfished condition. Overall, the Alaska wide sablefish annual catch limits and total catch are well below the biomass estimates from the annual stock assessments as shown in table two and particularly in figure five in the document. The NPFMC stock assessment process allows the ABC to be set below maximum permissible ABC if the author and the SSC concur that there is sufficient justification and assessment uncertainty. The risk table for the 2020 assessment concluded that there was substantially increased concern to major concern for sablefish in 2020. Therefore, in recent years, the sablefish ABCs have been set at precautionary levels relative to the maximum permissible ABC, and tax have been set at precautionary levels relative to the ABC. In 2020 and 2021, the council recommended sablefish tax lower than the ABCs to accommodate their concerns about the amount of harvest in the trawl and fixed gear fisheries, and to address socioeconomic and market considerations. TAC is then further allocated between gear sectors and then in the BSAI, also to CDQ and non-CDQ sectors. <clears throat> As shown in figure six on page seven of the document, the trawl sector has exceeded its sablefish allocation for the last three years as encounters with small sablefish have increased. A consequence of setting tax low relative to the maximum permissible ABC is that it becomes more difficult to avoid encounters when strong recruitment is driving a greater abundance of fish in the water. This is also true for the fixed gear sector, but the different IFQ management program largely prevents the possibility of overages in that program. TAC is allocated by year type in the Gulf of Alaska and the BSAI as shown in the table here and summarized on page seven of the document. In the central Gulf, 6.78% of the trawl CV and 3.51% of the trawl CP TAC is allocated to the rockfish program cooperatives and is deducted from the central Gulf trawl year allocation. In the BSAI, year allocations are further allocated between CDQ and non-CDQ. Regulations require 20% of the fixed year allocation to the CDQ reserve for each subarea. Regulations also require that in the BSAI 7.5% of the trawl gear allocation sablefish tax from the non-specified reserve be assigned to the CDQ reserve. In the BSAI in the Gulf of Alaska, 
the fixed year allocations for non-CDQ in the BSAI are fully allocated to the IFQ program, and no fixed year sable fish <clears throat> is set aside for incidental cast by vessels without IFQ. Maximum retainable amounts, or MRAs, are the maximum amount of the species closed to directed fishing that may be retained on board a vessel. Now, calculated as a percentage of the weight of catch of each species or species group open to directed fishing, known as the basis species, that is retained on board the vessel. The percentage of species closed to directed fishing retained in relation to the basis species must not exceed the MRA. <coughs> Excuse me. MRAs vary by, species, by basis species and are defined in Table 10 for the Gulf of Alaska and 11 for the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands, 50 CFR Part 679, and are summarized here. Please uh, note that the MRA for shallow water flatfish in the Gulf of Alaska is actually 1% rather than 7%, and that error carries through in this presentation and also in the document. Sablefish is spatially apportioned among the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, Western Gulf, Central Gulf, Western Yakutat, and Southeast Outside Management Areas. In December 1999, the Council apportioned the 2000 ABC and OFL based on a five-year exponential weighting of the Survey Abundance Index and Fishery Catch Per Unit Effort data, part partially to reduce variability in apportionment. In 2011, the Assessment Office determined that the reduced variability objective was not being met. Because of that high variability, the SSC fixed apportionment at the levels from the 2013 assessment with the intention that research on alternative apportionment methods would continue. The fixed levels have been used since then. Research on alternative apportionment methods is underway and is summarized in Appendix 3D of the 2020 Sablefish Assessment. Results of simulation work indicate that an apportionment of ABC to the six management regions can be conducted in numerous ways with a little variability in the average implications for the population. This is primarily due to a lack of data to understand if the Alaskan sablefish population is dependent on one or more productive spawning locations or juvenile habitats to sustain that population. Without this information, Assessment Office suggests that it is important to protect spawning biomass in all management areas and maintain fishing mortality on immature fish at reasonable levels. Regional apportionment to the management areas can result in differential impacts on the population, depending on ontogenetic changes in distribution and other assumptions in the apportionment scheme. Historically, young fish are first observed in the west, and older mature fish are more prevalent in the east. High catch in the western areas may lead to higher mortality on younger fish when above average year classes dominate, and high catches in the eastern areas may have a higher impact on the spawning stock biomass. Recent high recruitment has shifted the age structure of the population and resulted in higher directed and incidental catch of young fish. However, the 2020 stock assessment notes that there is not sufficient information to determine what impact that may have on the population, but given the magnitude of recent yards, large year classes, it's unlikely that moderate increases of catch of young fish will harm the stock. In this paper, we've not attempted to determine whether the recent increased catch is moderate. However, conversely, <clears throat> purposely avoiding young fish may inadvertently lead to increased mortality on larger mature fish, further reducing spawning stock biomass. Impacts then could be exacerbated if recent year classes do not materialize at the strength estimated by the assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me again. The trawl fisheries have exceeded several area-based trawl sablefish allocations in recent years as shown in Table 3 on page 10 of the document. Those catch data suggest that this is a recent occurrence coincident with incoming large year classes and generally occurs in the Bering Sea and the central Gulf of Alaska. But these figures show that there are some areas of higher sablefish catch that could be considered hotspots. However, those areas are also areas of high target species catch and effort. Therefore, rather than areas where more sablefish are present, it is likely that the figures reflect higher target effort and result in higher incidental sablefish catch. This will be further analyzed in an initial review draft should the Council initiate an analysis. 
Now this slide shows the information in Table 3, but just for the Bering Sea and Central Gulf where most of the recent overages have occurred. Before 2016, total sable fish catch in the trawl fisheries was down to less than 5% of the allocation of the TAC in the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, and Western Gulf, and less than 60% of the TAC in the Central Gulf. In both areas, you can see the sudden increase in sable fish catch that occurred after 2016, particularly in the Bering Sea, where the catch in 2020 was about 480% of the allocation, which is an overage of 3,537 tons, or 7.8 million pounds. Again, We've not attempted to project catch for future years, nor analyzed whether the increased catch is likely to have an impact on the recovery of spawning stock biomass. This is because, as has been stated previously, we lack sufficient information to determine what impacts the overages may have on the population, and we do not have alternatives to try to project future catch. Without alternatives and without enough information to determine potential impacts on the statewide stock, it's not possible to assess whether the increased catch is significant. It becomes a policy decision that the Council must make with available information. Unfortunately, the Council has recently made a policy decision about potentially significant levels of catch, and the Council can use that information as they make their decisions related to this discussion paper. In most but not all years since 2013, the Amendment 80 trawl sablefish catch has been higher than the AFA pollock trawl catch. However, since 2018, the AFA CV sector sablefish catch has increased markedly over their catch from 2013 through 2017. Again, this is coincident with the large increase in young sablefish observed in the surveys. Table 5 in the document shows the total trawl sablefish catch by sector in the Gulf. <coughs> Excuse me again. And Table 6 shows the temporal distribution of sablefish catch in the BSAI and the Gulf trawl fisheries. In recent years, the vast majority of that catch has occurred after June 10th. Trawl fisheries in the Bering Sea and the Gulf operate under a number of sector or cooperative level hard caps and PSC limits that influence their ability to respond to emerging incidental catch encounters. This is not to excuse any fishery from responsibilities regarding bycatch, but it does affect how those fleets can respond to council directives that may be conflicting or conflated. The Amendment 80 sector works with a varied portfolio of target species in a catch share program, as well as ground fish not allocated to the Amendment 80 program, such as sablefish. The Amendment 80 sector is subject to a number of prohibited and choked species that affect when and where their vessels operate. Vessel operators make complicated decisions that consider allocated and non-allocated species, PSC limits, and choke species. Vessel operators must be able to move their vessels to stay active in areas with the right species combinations in place to prosecute their fisheries. There's also a large difference in the quota allocations between the amendment aiding companies, so not all vessels respond the same way to all conditions. More details on the operations of the amendment aiding vessels are found in other council analyses um, most recently, the BSAI halibut ABM PSC limits analysis. The pelagic trawl fisheries, pelagic pollock trawl fisheries in the BSAI operate within a number of bycats and PSC hard caps that are monitored closely by the cooperatives. The most significant and recent council action includes measures to avoid Chinook and Chum salmon, including areas. Uh, closure areas and PSC limits, and development of incentive plan agreements designed to minimize the bycatch of Chinook salmon at all levels of Chinook abundance. These programs provide pollock fishery participants with incentives to limit Chinook salmon bycatch to performance standards, but also provide the fleet with flexibility to adapt to unanticipated changes in the fishery due to weather, operating conditions, or the status of target or bycatch species stocks. The CDQ, CV, CP, and mothership sectors have developed methods to track rates of bycatch for multiple species, including Chinook and Chum salmon, herring, and recently sablefish. Bycatch data are used to identify hot spots where bycatch rates are higher. If those rates are unacceptably high, the cooperatives can enact temporary closures to some or all of their cooperative members to move them to areas of presumed lower bycatch.
The December 2020 motion from the council requested that staff consider management measures to address sector allocation overages, such as time and area closures, reduced allocations to target species with high stable fish bycatch, intercooperative agreements and incentive programs, lower MRAs or extended MRA status, and actions that other councils have taken to address sector overages. Now, it's important to remember that because we do not have alternatives, it's not really possible to predict the effect of implementing any of these measures would have on the sablefish population, sablefish catch, or to quantitatively predict impacts to trawl or fixed gear sectors. When possible, we've tried to provide a qualitative assessment of potential impacts to each sector, but it has to be remembered that predicting the behavior of the fleet under hypothetical management measures is extremely difficult. Now, the Council and NIMS have enacted time and area closures to address issues including bycatch reduction, rebuilding stocks of low abundance, habitat protection, and protection for species on the U.S. endangered species list. Closures may be more effective when the target of concern, whether that be bycatch species, a habitat area, or, or other, is defined in either time or space. An example could be the coral garden protected areas that were closed to all bottom contact gear in 2005. These six habitat conservation zones total 110 square nautical miles with exceptionally high coral and sponge habitat. And because these are discrete areas designed to protect habitat for immobile benthic species, the closure is an effective method to reduce the potential fishing impacts. Sablefish, of course, are not bound by either time or space, and with the remarkable recruitment of year, recent year classes, appear to be ubiquitous on the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska grounds, as is shown in Table 6 and Figures 7 and 8 of the document. It may not be possible to identify locations or times when targeted closures could affect the overall rates of stable fish catch in the trawl fisheries, and it may be the case that closures would shift fishing effort to areas where the rates of bycatch are as high or higher than the closed areas. If bycatch rates are lower where the fleet redeploys, then overall bycatch rates of sablefish could be reduced. Alternatively, if the fleet moves to areas where the target CPUE is lower and bycatch rates are unchanged, it's possible that overall sablefish catch could be increased by a closure. Closures to reduce the catch of one species can also result in moving vessels into areas that have increased catch of other species that are the focus of conservation efforts. This is true for all gear types, not just trawl fisheries. Both the AFA Pollock and the Amendment 80 sectors have examples of moving to avoid one species and increasing the incidental catch of another species. With any time and area closure, it's likely that affected operators will redeploy their fishing effort to adjacent areas to make up catch and revenue that's put at risk. Analyses of other actions have attempted to identify where the catch may be made up when the time or area closures have been considered. Those analyses show that there are cases where widespread dispersal of the catch reprojection may lead to increasing, increasing operation costs. Those analyses have not found that any catch may actually be foregone. Rather, it's more likely that operational costs increase due to the relative production inefficiency imposed by the constraint. Onto genetic changes in sablefish distribution may also affect the impacts of time and area closures. Static closures may affect bycatch of some age classes of sablefish, but may be less effective as year classes mature and move to different areas. As described earlier, intercooperative agreements and incentive plan agreements help trawl cooperatives in the Bering Sea manage bycatch for the Chinook and Chum Salmon. The cooperatives also track data for in-season catch rates for other bycatch or prohibited species like halibut and herring and recently begun tracking bycatch rates for sablefish. Those intercooperative agreements and incentive programs were carefully crafted to meet specific objectives and are adjusted as the conservation goals change. The ICAs and IPAs could contribute to managing sablefish bycatch, but it's likely that a specific set of objectives would have to be identified in order to develop mechanisms that the cooperatives could employ to track and react to sablefish catch rates. Also importantly, the salmon IPAs contain incentives to offset the potentially increased costs of avoiding salmon. 
MRAs, as described earlier, limit the amount of species that may be retained when directed fishing for that species is closed. It's based on the percentage of an open species, known as the basis species, that is targeted. A previous analysis for Gulf of Alaska states evaluated the effects of lower MRAs on the catch of species for which directed fishing is closed. That analysis identified what we call the intrinsic catch rate as the rate that would occur if there were no market for the closed species or if there is no value to be obtained from catching the closed species. I've tried to ex explain that concept with the generic chart here. But it's important to note that we do not have data to identify an intrinsic rate of sable fish catch for any 12 fisheries. So in this generic figure, if we consider the, the intrinsic rate to be represented by the gray area in the chart, we see that it can be considered constant, which of course is an oversimplification of reality. Now if we consider the red line to be the MRA, we can see that it can be changed. If the intrinsic rate is less than the MRA, then lowering the MRA may reduce the catch If the, however, if the intrinsic rate is equal to or greater than the MRA, then there will be little effect of lowering the MRA other than increasing the amount of regulatory discounts. MRAs can provide opportunity for the prosecution of low value fish by allowing higher value fish to be retained up to the MRA. In the Gulf, the Aratooth flounder fishery may be subsidized by 7% MRA for sable fish based on the Aratooth flounder basis species. Now, if the sable fish intrinsic rate of catch is lower than the 7% MRA, reducing the MRA may result in lower overall sable fish catch, but at some cost to the Aratooth fishery participants. If the intrinsic rate is higher than the 7% MRA, lowering the MRA would have little effect on the overall sable fish catch, but a greater proportion of the catch would be discarded again at a cost of the air tube fishery participants. The MRA for most basic species is 1%, which is the minimum that allows for some retention before all catches are required to be discarded. Lowering the MRA from 1% is equivalent to prohibiting retention at the beginning of the season and would result in an increased regulatory discards without having any appreciable effect on the rate of sable fish catch for those species. The Council annually sets tax for all species in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska FMPs during the harvest specifications process. Is there a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McLean. On, on the previous slide, I guess, and sorry if we were trying to get through the whole presentation without questions, but I guess I was, even with a simplification, I, I thought Part of the point of your previous paper is that the intrinsic catch rate is not um, stable or fixed and and changes with conditions, conditions like extreme events and in the stock of stable fish where we're seeing huge year classes. So I was just I was just wondering about the how I should be taking this potential management feature slide and what the take. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Kimball. Uh, you're absolutely right that the intrinsic rate um, is very much dependent on the conditions in nature. So it is not um, static, um, which is why I tried to explain that this is a very much a oversimplification of nature. So um, the image that we've got in here, you consider over a short period of time. Um, so year to year, there will be very there will be changes in the intrinsic rate of catch based on the abundance of the um, prohibited species. So, in recent years, as the abundance of sable fish has gone up, it is very likely that an intrinsic rate has gone up considerably. So, what all I was trying to display here is that the areas here below. Where there is a, a difference in the intrinsic, where the intrinsic rate is lower than the MRA, lowering the MRA in this circumstance might result in this area here being savings of the prohibited catch. 
However, if you lower the MRA below the intrinsic rate, the area here in gray would be those areas um, requiring additional uh, regulatory discards. And no more questions. I didn't. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, please do. Uh, please do let me know if there are other questions. So, the council annually sets tax for all species in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska FMPs during the harvest specifications process. Um, again, I'm really uh, thankful to have Mary Perea, Steve Whitney, and Dan Gaithel available um, for this discussion um, specific to their questions. So in the BSAI, total tax is generally set at the 2 million ton cap to achieve OY, or optimum yield. Pollock is the most abundant fish species in the Bering Sea, and Pollock tax has averaged 1.3 million tons from 2011 to 2020. Pollock tack has also been set well below its ABC during that time, 18,000 tons below in 2011 to 1,455,000 tons below in 2017. Sector allocations for the Bering Sea Pollock fishery are set by the American Fisheries Act and the CDQ program. Any decrease in the Bering Sea Pollock tack to address higher sablefish catch would also reduce tack for sectors that have lower sablefish incidental catch. Tack for more valuable species is generally set to the ABC, and these fisheries generally also have lower incidental catch of sablefish. <clears throat> tax for sablefish are generally set below, uh, sorry, tax for flatfish are generally sell up be set below their ABC. The Amendment 80 allocated flatfish species have relatively low incidental catch of sablefish, even in their recent high recruitment years, or they have relatively low targeted catch. Other species that are targeted and have higher incidental catch of sablefish include Greenland turbot and Eritrean flounder. Greenland turbot tack is generally set below ABC and is a relatively low tack compared to other species. Reducing the Greenland turbot tack is likely to affect hook and line CPs that also participate in the Greenland turbot fishery. The Aratooth flounder tack supports directed fishing and is also necessary to support directed fishing of other species. Reducing the Aratooth flounder tack could constrain the CDQ pollock fishery by the incidental catch of Aratooth flounder. CDQ groups are hard capped by all of their CDQ allocated species, which include Aratooth flounder. The Council cannot increase the percentage of the Aratooth flounder tack allocated in the CDQ program because the MSA select, sets the CDQ allocation of BSAI Aerotooth flounder at 10.7% of the TAC. If the Bering Sea Pollock TAC were reduced and the Council continued to set the BSAI total TAC at 2 million tons, TACs could be increased for flatfish species with low incidental catch of sablefish. However, those fisheries are generally constrained by Pacific cod and halibut PSC limits, so increasing flatfish to balance the decrease of pollock would likely decrease the total catch in the DSEI ground fish fisheries. Also, pollock is taken as an incidental catch in other fisheries, and a decrease in pollock tax and increases in other species tax may increase the percentage of the pollock tax necessary to support that incidental catch, thereby decreasing pollock allocated to AFA sectors. In the Gulf, most of the ground fish tax is set equal to the ABC, except for species that contribute to the state's guideline harvest level fisheries, those are Pacific cod and pollock. Um, species for which the tack is set only to support incidental catch, such as active mackerel, or species that have higher ABCs, but for which catch is limited because halibut and salmon PSC limits prevent increased catch, and that's most flatfish species. Finally, as requested, MPFMC staff contacted staff from other councils around the country to investigate whether those other councils have enacted programs to limit incidental mortality in their managed fisheries. In general, the other councils have considered or implemented some of the tools considered in this paper and other methods that the NPFMC has enacted for other issues, including time area closures, set-asides for some species, cooperative agreements, and moving species from managed status to ecosystem component status. 
None of the other council staff indicated that they were facing similar circumstances, although the Pacific Fishery Management Council staff were interested in the issue because they're also anticipating large year classes of sablefish affecting their fisheries. Most of the other staff simply said good luck. That uh, concludes the presentation for D2, Sablefish Trawl Overages Discussion Paper. Again, uh, I am pleased to have Mary Perrin, Steve Whitney, and Dan Gaithill available to help respond to questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. McClain. Mr. Mark, any questions? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. McClain, for your uh, presentation. Just looking looking back when you when you showed the figure six, the bar chart, you know, with the uh, exceeding in 2018, 2019, and 2020, but there's a pretty long history there, including some, I don't know what's going way back, the, the increases in the late 60s and 70s. But I, my question is, have, have we seen this type of overage in the past in this fishery with sable fish? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Marks. I am not aware um, of that, although I did not specifically look to see in, in the far distant past whether or not we have had those uh, overages. And I will ask Mary or Steve if they've got information about whether or not we've seen these overages in the past. Thank you. Um, do the chair, this is Steve Whitney with in season management. And I can't, I mean, I can't recall anything in the pollock fishery. I know in the MM80 sector, people have been searching for stable fish for decades, and they've come up with them. So there might be something kind of beyond the normal records I look at, but nothing that I'm aware of. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Mark, uh, further questions? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. McLean. Okay, well, that uh, concludes the staff presentation. Uh, so we can move to our advisory panel report. I believe Ms. Christensen will be providing that. I'd like to um, remind members of the public to please sign up to testify by the end of the advisory panel report. Mr. Chair, this is Ruth. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, for the record, uh, Ruth Christensen here to give the AP report on agenda item D2. The AP recommends the council develop an expanded discussion paper further considering management tools and accountability measures to mitigate trawl sablefish overages and expand it to include similar overages in PCOD. The paper should address the following. Include options to use a bycatch or incidental catch rate that may reflect the current MRA percentages as a baseline starting point to trigger accountability measures when a sector exceeds an allocation. These AM could be further refined as the council determines the parameters of AM. Examine incidental or bycatch accrual rates against target catch over a time series. Provide the council data on when incidental rates of catch increase and methods to mitigate. Include exploration of the size, volume, and percentage of stable fish in, compar in comparison to target species landed when the sector in question is over an MRA or allocation. Further data of stable fish catch in the trawl sector could aid in the stock assessment and inform the authors if there are biological concerns with catches that exceed allocations. Examine how these accountability measures could be applied on a sector-specific level to similar overages occurring in the incidental catch of PCOD 
and how those additional AM would affect directed PCOD fisheries currently impacted by overages. Examine how these tools could be applied to other species and programs experiencing, in, experiencing similar management challenges and where catch rates become unmanageable, unmanageable at the co-op level and exceed allocations or MRAs. An expanded discussion of potential incentives for inter-co-op agreements and incentive plans. Additional discussion is needed for management measures that would provide the necessary incentive to reduce sector overages. Consider whether the TAC for stablefish is set at the appropriate level for current stablefish biomass. And that motion, as amended, passed 11 to 7. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Are there any questions? Mr. Twight. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Ms. Christensen. Can you um, go back to the previous, the, the first page of your slide? Thank you. Um, I'm trying to understand the third bullet. Is this something that would be, is this a suggestion to be done now, or is this a suggestion to be done in the future when a sector is over a, an MRA or an allocation? Mr. Ch Mr. Twight, through the chair, um, it's something to be done now in regards to the stable fish overages um, in the trawl sector. That that was the point of, of um, including this bullet. So, um, and, and I, I have several questions here, but I think I'll just boil it down to the second one. The, the further data of stable fish catch could aid in the stock assessment and inform the authors if they're biological concerns. I don't understand how that works. Can you um, provide me with a, um, a dis description of how um, these additional data would inform the authors and aid in the stock assessment? Um, Mr. Toit, through the chair, in our, um, during AP discussions and, and the back and forth, you know, between, amongst AP members um, and, and the maker of this motion, it was clarified um, by the maker of the motion that that the, the request in this bullet to, you know, to aid in the stock assessment um, was an assumption that was that was made. Um, and and that the the maker of the motion wasn't aware um, of any specific requests or or data needs um, that were highlighted by by the assessment author. And so I don't know that I can get at. We didn't discuss or or it wasn't specified how exactly um, the data being requested would aid in the stock assessment, given that it was um, an assumption that was made. Thank you for your answer. Thanks, Mr. Twight. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Ruth. I have a question about the first bullet on this slide. I'm trying to understand how what, what the AP intended by recommending this. And if I'm reading it correctly, when a sector exceeds an allocation, I assume that's a, a sector TAC, that the accountability measures envisioned by the AP would kick in uh, the following year. I guess that's a question. And then 
is a specific accountability measure in this bullet some sort of rate-based accountability measure that would apply if it's triggered? Is that the, the general concept of what's being suggested there? Ms. Baker, through the chair, I'm going to answer your second question first. Um, and so you are correct that it the it would be a, a rate-based um, trigger for an accountability measure. Um, as to the first part of your question regarding um, whether the accountability measure would be applied the following year or, or at some other time, um, that actually wasn't discussed at the AP and it wasn't specified um, during, you know, our, our any questions or answers or we, we didn't broach that, that particular point of when the accountability measure would be applied. Thank you uh, for that. And, and then one follow-up question, Mr. Chair. In terms of the term accountability measures used uh, in, a, in a couple of places in this motion, I, I assume, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that accountability measures in, in the AP's recommendation refers uh, to some sort of measure taken when a sector exceeds an allocation like a tax uh, that the council could develop as opposed to the accountability measures that are required under the Magnuson-Stevens Act for exceeding an annual catch limit, for example. Is that correct? Ms. Baker, through the chair, that, yes, you are correct that that is the intent um, in referring to accountability measures um, in this motion. Thank you. No more questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Christensen. And Ms. Baker asked one of my questions, but Ruth, I was just seeing if I could get a better explanation. I just don't understand this, the phrase in the first bullet to use a bycatch or incidental catch rate that may reflect the current MRA percentages. It, it, can you just try again in explaining what, what that phrase is, what, what, what would be the trigger, I guess, for some different action, I guess, when a sector exceeds an allocation? I'm not following that concept. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, it, was, it was brought up during um, our conversation at the AP that you know, catches or incidental catches of stable fish, um, higher incidental catches of stable fish occur at different different times of the year. So, you know, bee season in particular. And so I think the intent um, of, of this bullet, and while the language, you know, may be not the best, the intent would be to establish a rate of incidental catch, you know, based on, um, uh, you know, the to the target catch that would then, once that rate is hit, once that rate is triggered, that is when an accountability measure would be applied. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Christensen? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, the second bullet um, directing the analyst to examine incidental or bycatch accrual rates against target catch um, to provide the council data on when incidental rates of catch increase. Um, I'm not at all clear what the value of that is. Can you walk through um, what um, the AP's uh, intent was with this one and, and how they um, think it could contribute to um, 
managing um, by catch rate? Mr. Twight, through the chair, you know, I think, you know, it's the first and the second bullet I think are very similar and, and are attempting to get at the, the same um, concern, I guess, from this motion or the same, um, you know, points of consideration in this motion. And that is to, you know, because um, these incidental catch rates are differ throughout, you know, the course of the year. Um, the intent is to examine those rates throughout, you know, over time series throughout the, you know, um, over the course of the year to, to maybe identify a certain time of the year or a certain um, level of catch that may be informative to, to use as um, a trigger for apply, then applying an accountability measure. So I think bullets one and two are, are, are very similar in, in getting at um, the, the same point of, of the motion. Thanks. Um, nothing further. Okay. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Christensen. Just on your last bullet to consider whether tax for stable fish is set at appropriate levels, when I look at your the rationale that was kind of really talking about setting ABC and, and adjustments from that, but but over the last couple of years, we've the council has, has set lower lower TAC one one to to bridge between the the uh, juveniles and to get additional carryover to assist spawning stock biomass. But last year, the the main focus was was to essentially adjust foreign markets for large sable fish and and uh, potential with worry about setting that too high with the price is going to be low. But my question is, was there any discussion about kind of the differing effect of that on the on the two sectors and differing objectives um, to, to look at those actually separately when we do that to, to uh, set, set, say, the, the uh, trawl catch at, at TAC where you could actually set the uh, directed fishery at an adjusted level that, that really better suits their objectives. Is, is, did that concept come up in the AP? Mr. Marks, through the chair, yes, it did. Um, it was recognized, you know, that that there is that 50-50 split between um, trawl and the directed fishery. Um, and, and, you know, the, the intent of this bullet um, is to examine um, all the points that you brought up, you know, at, in a more holistic manner, given that 50-50 that separation or allocation. And then, you know, given um, the, the differing needs of, of the two fisheries. Thank you. Any further questions on the AP report? Okay, thank you, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. All right, that will move us into public comment. And uh, so we will close the sign up period and like we have 13 members of the public signed up to testify. First up will be Paul Clampett, then Bob Alverson, then Steve Martell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Paul Clampett. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm Paul Clampett. I'm uh, president of the Sable Fish and Help and Pot Association and uh, owner of the Fishing Vessel Augustine. Uh, our, our organization um, supports the APP's action on the agenda item D2, Trawl Sable Fish Overages. And uh, I think the important thing to limit trawl sable fish overages is that the National Marine Fisheries Service does not see any possible way for the trawl industry to avoid sable fish overages without causing more damage to other fisheries. So they basically wash their hands of the matter and conclude that the 7.8 million pounds of discarded sable fish is insignificant in terms of harming the overall stock. This conclusion seems to us at odds with the National Fisheries Service earlier study regarding sable fish discards in the fixed gear fleet where they felt there was a danger to the spawning biomass of sable fish. It's obvious to us that both these conclusions can't be true at the same time, and even more obvious that the trawl industry, as it is currently operating, cannot function without harming every other user group in the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. We feel that the council should direct the National Fishery Service to revisit trawl bycatch to try and find a way in which they can operate without detrimentally impacting the rest of the user groups in Alaska. A more holistic approach that make the trawl fleet responsible for what they discard, such as the Trawl West Coast Rationalization Program implemented by the Pacific Management Council would be a huge improvement. And thanks for your opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Mr. Clampett. I think Mr. Bal Dr. Baltiger has a question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Clampett, for your testimony. Uh, do you think that the uh, regulations that are currently in place, which of course came through the council and implemented by the fishery service, but their council uh, desires. Do you think that those regulations actually have a uh, something that the region, that the fishery service has missed that we could use to stop or, or slow down the trawl overages? Or do you think that the regulations that we have uh, are what's binding any ability to find a way to uh, slow down their overage? Thank you for the question uh, through the chair. I, I, I think that uh, the latter is true, that uh, um, we're hamstrung by the current regulations and I feel that there needs to be a, uh, an overhaul. Um, I think the Pacific Management Council made a huge improvement in those fisheries down there by um, making every individual and, and trawl organization responsible for their for their overages and for their bycatch. And I just think it works extremely well. I, I operate, we operate in both fisheries and uh, we think that they're on the right track in the Pacific Council. And I know that the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council has addressed this and has tried to move forward with it. And that we just um, hopefully can, can get back on track with trial rationalization or, uh, comprehensively. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I didn't intend to imply by my question that we're that the, the regulations hamstrung things. It's just that I believe that we are operating by the regulations of my only point. So thank you, for, Mr. Clampett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions? All right, thanks for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Next up is Bob Alberson. Yep, Mr. Chairman, this is Bob Alberson. You picking map? We are. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and fellow council members. Um, on behalf of Fishing Vessel Owners Association, I'll be uh, commenting on D2 for, in their behalf uh, with regards to the report that is being analyzed here or reviewed that was prepared by Steve uh, McQueen, Mary Farunas, Steve Whitney, and Josh Keaton. I, I read uh, from page 16 at the bottom. It says, however, because we lack data to determine 
the impact of Mata's fishing mortality on a recent year class, it is not possible to determine reductions in fishing mortality. future spawning biomass. So the way I'm interpreting that statement is that uh, the mar word modest, the operative word modest, um, I think uh, Dana Hanselman used uh, the word uh, de minimis in December to describe from the trawl fleet that so that amount is so modest compared to the six hundred million tons of biomass it's just difficult to determine what any impact would have because it's Small, and our, our group would agree with that assessment, that uh, the resource is uh, extremely large and uh, this amount is, is what uh, these gentlemen and, and uh, Mary indicate is, is modest. However, like Paul, we reference you back James Armstrong and Dr. Kreiger that suggested that the release of small sable fish may, may have an impact, a negative impact on the spawning biomass. And your SC picked that up as well.
present.
Mr. Chair. Your authors are having relative to the trawl uh, bycatch. Arizona. And how we would um, at least know the level of discard so that we could put that into the process appropriately. And I recall 
some expression that folks were willing to work on some of those concerns over the summer in order to, to bring that analysis back to but not have it um, the same conclusion necessarily after resolving those problems. And my question is whether one selection willing to kind of work through some of the problems for the council. Um, thank you. Question through the chair. Um, uh, Nicole, I, I think that uh, the answer in the observer program, um, part of the for the North Pacific program is that's only coming in at 15%, whereas we have a
solution Cool. Uh, 
says need to be Um, Mr. Chair, 